let's return to active site composition um, and think about these polar groups in the active site a little bit more thoroughly. Here I've drawn the active site of the protease papain, which is very similar to the serine proteases in that there's the activation of a nucleophile. In this case, though, the nucleophile is a, is a cysteine side chain, not a serine side chain. But we see the activation occurring in the same way. The key here is that ionization at the active site is very important. Now, let's think about what that means. And, and when we, whenever we talk about ionization of side chains, our mind should always hearken back to the notion that we're talking about a pH-dependent quantity. So we can look at the reaction rate, or let's think about it as um, V0, for example, uh, initial reaction velocity, as a function of pH. And for some enzyme, I'm not saying this is for papain, although papain does have, have a strong pH dependence, we might see that there are... Uh, p um, ionizations that occur at low pH and at high pH that affect the, the that affect the activity and in this case this this cartoon shows that this particular enzyme might have a maximum of activity around pH 7 what does that mean well of course it depends on the what we're talking about is the protonation state of, of active site residues perhaps side chains but also perhaps it could be the termini of the protein as in certain cases what we can see is that on this low scale the deprotonation of some side chain is probably required, right? We're talking about as we go above the pKa, we begin to dominate, be predominantly the deprotonated species. For example, carboxylic acid residues are charged above their pKa, above, above physiological pH, and they are protonated and uncharged below their physiological, uh, below their pKa. Uh, likewise, on the other end, we see that protonation is required for this, for this act, uh, active site. Um, for this active site amino acid. So again, below its pKa, we have to, it's protonated. So we see that one residue has to be protonated, the other has to be deprotonated for this to, for this to take place. Here again is a great example of, of how pKa's of side chains can be uh, manipulated um, by the it, detailed chemical environment in which they find themselves, sometimes by several pH units. In this case, I believe it's fair to say that the high pKa, pH 8, is the, is the um, protonation of the imidazole of this histidine, and the low pA, pKa is the deprotonation of this serine. So, I'm sorry, this uh, cysteine. So, in fact, what we, what we really require here for the enzyme to proceed is this to exist as an ion pair. So, we don't think so much about this, this imidazole. Uh, uh, abstracting the proton from the, cyst from the cysteine as we do about the activity requiring there to be an ion pair formation here. In any case, composition of the active site uh, and, the, and, the, and the function of the active site depends intimately on the pKa of the side chains involved. Thinking a little bit more about general acid-base catalysis, Remember that your book draws a distinct distinction between specific acid-base catalysis in which water is doing uh, the cat doing the the uh, acid and base driven uh, a catalysis uh, versus general acid-base catalysis in which in which there's some other molecule. Typically, it's going to be an amino acid side chain. Um, so they, as we know, acids donate protons, bases accept protons, and here I say a, a strong base can abstract protons from hydroxyl, from amino groups, from, and sometimes from CH bonds as well. Now, strong, what do I mean by that? Well, really, we're not talking about strong bases in, in, the, in the enzyme active sites. We're talking about relatively weak bases. Let's just call them good bases, uh, remembering that the bases for us are typically, well, they're going to be they're going to be our the, the usual suspects, histidine, aspartic acid, lysine. I'm, and I'm using both the, the traditionally acidic and traditionally basic amino acid side chains because we see that, they, that one residue can act as both acid and base in different contexts and at different points in the reaction mechanism. So we'll see them bouncing around. In any case, let's go back and see that we have a lone pair here that... Um, uh, uh, so this this base is going to abstract a proton from this functional group, and the electrons go back go back to the 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 uh, this this uh, whatever this happens to be um, this atom, and what we wind up with is some perhaps activated functional group, and then we've so we've accepted a proton. 
So we abstract protons. Now this would now this is behaving as an acid. This is behaving as a base. Now let's also see that we can use uh, activated hydroxyls, as we've mentioned before, to cleave other bonds. In this case, here is the base abstraction of proton, as we saw, as we saw in the case. Um, well, as we saw, as we've seen previously, we see abstraction of the proton from water, and now water is acting as the base to, um, or acting as the nucleophile to act to attack that carbonyl carbon. And we've seen this kind of structure before already. Uh, we see that the we formed this oxyanion, which is unstable, but which immediately collapses, and this this group becomes our leaving group, and the 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 departure of that group is facilitated by this base that was just protonated in the previous step, now acting as an acid from which uh, the proton is abstracted by this nitrogen. So we see here that we can act as a base in the beginning, whatever this is. And let's let's just call it a histidine for, for argument's sake, but it doesn't matter. It acts as a base in this case, abstracting a proton. It acts as an acid in the next case, take, uh, giving up that proton immediately back to the substrate. And then we see that after abstraction of its proton, it's, it's ready to go again, uh, and it's, the active site has been regenerated. So we, I think we get the idea here about acid-base catalysis, and it seems perfectly obvious to us what the players in acid-base catalysis should be. Those are our ionizable side chains. And again, we see that they can play a variety of different roles at different stages in a single reaction mechanism. Covalent catalysis, we've already mentioned previously. Uh, again, we're just running through the laundry list here of different react, different sort of standard uh, aspects of, of reaction mechanisms. Often we see covalent intermediates in different enzymatic reactions. There might be a variety of reasons for this, um, and we can see that a variety of side chains might act as either nucleophile or electrophile, depending on the situation, forming a transient covalent bond. And that's illustrated here where this hydroxyl eventually becomes acylated with some functional group. We don't know what it is, but it's the substrate. And then a water comes in, hydrolyzes that bond, and off goes the substrate but now uh, in a chemically modified state, right? So the, the important thing, one important detail to, to make sure we're clear on here, though, is that w a, a good reason for going through a covalent intermediate such as this is that we've anchored the substrate. So some chemistry is taking place but hasn't been completed yet, and in fact the chemistry itself is completed with the addition of this water across, the, across that um, acyl gr group the idea is that our substrate is immobilized. Right? The, the substrate isn't acted on, then wanders away before the action is complete. The, the action takes place in the active site of the enzyme in multiple steps. So we facilitate the reaction by keeping the substrate immobilized. Now we've already mentioned metal ion mediated catalysis. Here again is that same example of carbonic anhydrase. We see that the zinc ion, the zinc cation is mobilized by a few histidines. This is a very common theme. And we see that that localized positive charge supports the development of a negative charge on the water. So a water molecule binds and we see the development of negative charge as this that this proton becomes very much more acidic, right? So in the absence of the enzyme, the pKa of, of the water is 15. It's not going to deprotonate. But in the presence of the, of the enzyme active site bound to the zinc, uh, we can deprotonate readily at physiological conditions. Now, the point here being that we frequently see divalent cations acting as in the role of the strong electrophile in enzyme active sites. Again, reminding you that in, in that case, perhaps the enzyme doesn't do a whole lot more than act as a scaffold for the inorganic atom to do its business with the substrate. Carbonic anhydrase is an interesting example. Uh, uses zinc to convert CO2 to carbonic acid. So remembering that the real substrate in carbonic anhydrase, which is what I'm, the cartoon of the active site here, uh, uh, the real substrate isn't the water. The real substrate is CO2, which needs to be converted to carbonic acid to be readily to, in a more soluble form. Um, the, the carbonic acid conversion occurs through the addition of this hydroxyl group to the CO2. So you can see now this is a strong nucleophile. It's going to attack the carbon of CO2 and then be released as carbonic acid. And then the active site is regenerated so that we can bind another water molecule and begin again metal ion mediated catalysis. I guess it's worth showing 
oh, what was the point? The point here is that these are called co these metal ions are called cofactors, and there's a nice table, not an exhaustive table, but a nice table that shows you some other metal cofactors that play roles in various enzyme active sites. Here I have a cartoon to show you. This is copper zinc superoxide dismutase. This is a draw. I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, this enzyme utilizes metals in the act in the active site, and we're familiar with metals in the active site for a variety of reasons at this point. But this is the metals in the active site of the link, <laughs> uh, zinc active site. Um, this is a drawing handmade by um, this woman, Dr. Jane Richardson. She's a, she's a professor at Duke. Um, this drawing was made in the 80s. Um, but she was a pioneer of these ribbon structures, really beginning her work in the 60s and really accelerating in the 70s. Um, so she's a, she's a pioneer of structural biology and a pioneer of molecular representations. So another reason to show you this is that, that this is sort of a historical cartoon of, of the type that we're very familiar with seeing now. There's a disulfide bond. Um, what does this enzyme do? It converts the superoxide uh, ion to peroxide. Um, superoxide is generated in a variety of biological reactions. It's very, very toxic, uh, reacting in, with a variety of other molecules. Um, superoxide dismutase rapidly converts it to peroxide, which is itself dangerous, uh, a dangerous um, oxidizer as well. However, there are other enzymes that are involved in the degradation of peroxide. Um, but, but it's worth talking about superoxide dismutase in the context of enzyme kinetics again. Uh, here's a chart that I stole from... Uh, uh, can't rem uh, it doesn't matter where at this point. Essentially, it's just a matter. It's just a, a cartoon showing us rates versus pH for a variety of superoxide dismutases. Remember, these are enzymes that are converting the 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 very dangerous uh, um, 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 superoxide anion to peroxide. And we see that in the absence of catalyst, we have this interesting pH dependence. This is just a matter of the of of uh, whether we're whether we're acid or base catalyzed, I won't go into that, but in, basically in water, we see that at pH 7, we have a rate constant of something around 10 to the 5, which is a respectable rate constant, but we see that in the presence of these different superoxide dismutases, we see that a massive rate enhancement. So basically uh, maybe 1,000 or 10,000 fold rate enhancement in the presence of this enzyme. Remembering that up here we're talking about a kinetically perfect enzyme that's in the in the range of the of the diffusion limit of the reaction. So what what superoxide dismutase has done is create a create a way a way of accelerating the the degradation of this toxic anion um, so that it's basically n never exists in solution in our in f under physiological conditions. Uh, an interesting aside, um, and we'll stop there and pick it up with serine protease mechanisms in our next lecture. Just reminding you of the importance of metals in the active site, and we can see here for these other superoxide dismutases, other metal ions play a role in that catalysis in these other cases.